Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This week, the United Launch Alliance made a historic announcement signalling the end of an era. Tori Bruno confirmed that every single Atlas V has now been sold to customers and there will be no more. There are 29 launches left and they go to a variety of customers, some to NASA, some to the DoD, some to commercial partners. There's seven of them, I believe, assigned to Starliners. Nine of them will be launching Project Kuiper for Amazon. But after that, there is no more. By the end of the decade, Atlas will no longer be flying. And by the way, by the end of the decade, the Delta IV will no longer be flying. And Atlas and Delta have been the sort of, they've been at the core of rocket launches in the US going back to the 1950s. Both of these rockets have their roots in ICBM or miss you know, ballistic missile development. The Thor and the Delta essentially happened in parallel. They started building the intercontinental uh, Atlas ICBM, right? And they realized that its complex engine staging system, where two of the engines had to drop off and the third kept running, was going to delay things, make things take a little longer. So they spun up a program to develop another shorter range rocket called Thor that had a single engine. And instead of having to cross huge continental distances, they would fly them on planes out to England and station them there where they could strike Russia. Now, after uh, these things were superseded, they got turned into launch vehicles. So obviously Atlas just evolved over time uh, through various iterations into the Atlas V. The Delta, sorry, the Thor began as the Thor launch system and then they had second stages. And eventually one of the second stages was called Delta. So it became the Thor Delta system and eventually it just became Delta. So uh, Delta III was the last one that was really closely based on that. Delta IV was quite a uh, departure. I think the only thing that was really in common between Delta III and Delta IV was the fairing design and one version of the second stage. But it, regardless, these things are going to stop flying in the next decade. And it means that going forward, almost all the US launch capability will be based on uh, launch vehicles which were not built as ICBMs anymore. These have been built as commercial launch vehicles. Certainly there's a few ICBM derivatives there, but you know, this is huge. So the reason for this retirement is that the Atlas V uses Russian RD-180 engines. And they use those engines because they are arguably the best engines in the world for kerosene and liquid oxygen propellant. They get amazing thrust to weight ratio. They get the best uh, specific impulse. They have great throttle control. They, they're objectively amazing in every way. The only thing you might argue is the Merlin engines used on SpaceX's uh, Falcon 9s have probably better throttle control and they have better thrust to weight ratio. But really, those are only useful if you're landing it. Yes, I know. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, the RD-180s were brought in in the 1990s. After the fall of the Soviet Union, there were US rocket companies that started looking at potential applications of Soviet technology. And they found these engines that were, frankly, they didn't believe the numbers when they saw them. They thought that there had to be some translation issue. They don't, no way you can get that kind of performance out of a kerosene engine. Well, turns out that they had, that Russia and the Soviet Union had really put their development uh, expertise into, into developing closed cycle, oxidizer rich, uh, you know, kerosene engines. And the US hadn't done that. The US instead had focused its efforts on hydrogen based engines and, and the Soviet Union lagged far behind the US in that category. But these uh, RD-180 engines were one of the sort of derivatives of this program. And those have been sold to mount onto Atlas V. So it started out actually, the first version of an Atlas with the RD-180 engine was the Atlas III. And they launched those six times starting in the year 2000. And that was just basically an old school stainless steel Atlas with a slightly different boat tail. Uh, with the rest of the rocket largely being similar. Atlas V was a very heavy redesign on that front with uh, the one thing that did maintain was the Centaur upper stage, which was largely unchanged at that point. But the Atlas V with those 
Russian engines has proved to be amazingly reliable. Like it's had all, basically 100% success rate. There have been a couple of close misses and, and not all of those were related to the RD-180, but there was one case for sure where it was launching a Cygnus spacecraft and the main stage cut off five seconds early because of the propellant mixture wasn't set correctly. And thankfully, the open or the closed loop guidance on the second stage Centaur was able to make up the difference and get that payload into orbit only just like the Centaur was supposed to deorbit itself later with a 10 second burn and only managed a few seconds of that. So that is amazing, but the problem has become that national security uh, launches have started requiring that the RD-180 engines no longer be used for national security payloads. And that was initially supposed to happen in you know, a few years ago, but now the sort of cutoff deadline has been pushed to 2022. And that means by that date, ULA has to have Vulcan flying because they're not going to be selling any more Delta IVs. They're not going to be able to sell Atlas Vs. They have to have Vulcan flying. And Vulcan is their new generation launch vehicle. It's going to do everything that Delta can do, everything that Atlas can do. And it's going to use engines that are built by Blue Origin, the BE4 engines that are using methane and liquid oxygen, and they're going to use closed cycle high performance uh, engines. And they have yet to actually deliver the production engines for, to ULA for integration and testing. Uh, they've been firing this engine on test stands, optimizing them for construction uh, for, so they can build them in the factory. But those, that's taking a little longer than they expected. And I, I'm going to say, I, I've heard that this is a management issue rather than a technological issue. But anyway, uh, you know, regardless, um, that's what's happening there. Interestingly, because the RD-180 was so critical to US launch capability, part of the requirements of getting access or being allowed to use the RD-180 on a US launch vehicle was that ULA had to get or secure licenses and the necessary technical know-how to build them themselves, to build licensed copies of the RD-180. And that was an option for a while, but ultimately it was never pursued and they decided to go with a completely different rocket design for the future, you know, going forwards. So the RD-180 has its roots in the Soviet era Energia rocket. That was the massive rocket developed to carry the Soviet Buran shuttle into orbit. And it would have a hydrogen core, but the boosters on the side were liquid fueled kerosene, liquid oxygen with an RD-170 engine on it. And those uh, boosters, actually, they became the Zenit rocket, which was later used uh, for, by sea launch to put satellites into geostationary orbit from a floating launch platform. So the RD-170 is basically a four nozzle version of the RD-180. The RD-180 is actually a cut in half version where they, both of them, they have a single set of turbo pumps and plumbing, but they just feed into different numbers of nozzles. Now there's also the RD-191 or the RD-190, and those are single engine versions, and they are actually still in use. Uh, even after Atlas stops flying, the RD-191 will continue. So in the US, RD-191 is used in the Antares rocket, which is Northrop Grumman's launch vehicle that's used to launch cargo to the space station on the Cygnus spacecraft. So uh, instead of having a single engine with um, two nozzles, those are two separate engines. I think there might have been some licensing requirement that forced them to do this, but uh, also the RD-191 is going to be the main engine used in the Angara rocket. And so Angara is the, the, the first properly, purely Russian-built launch vehicle. Because Proton and Soyuz are great Soviet-era launch vehicles, but they included parts that are built in Russia, in Ukraine, in probably other parts of the former Soviet republics. And so Russia wanted to have a purely domestic vehicle, and that's what Angara is supposed to be. And so there, that is interesting because that's actually going to be ultimately replacing the Proton. And I've sort of talked about this in the past. There are Proton launches still planned, but they would really like to retire it because it's a very expensive launch vehicle. And Kazakhstan really doesn't like the, that amount 
of you know, really toxic hypergolic propellants in a single rocket. So Angara is going to be the replacement and that means that Proton is also going to be retiring in the next decade. So this is a wild decade. We're seeing the end of Atlas, Delta and Proton. All these Cold War icons disappearing and being replaced by modern, you know, purely civilian launch fields. Okay, I mean, Proton was never used as an ICBM, although it was originally envisaged as an ICBM that could carry a monster warhead. It never made it that far, thankfully. And so, you know, it shouldn't be surprising, given technological progress, that these things do have a shelf life. It is amazing that they are still with us after over 60 years, but now realize that their time is limited. And if you want to see them, you should probably start planning now. Uh, on the other hand, I won't be surprised if the uh, Soyuz derived from the R7 keeps flying up to its 100th anniversary. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.